but not letting your emotions get involved. If you don't like a passage or if you don't like what a passage says, you immediately begin to rationalize or come up with some meaning that this can't possibly mean that. Because, There's got to be another meaning. Yeah, this can't possibly mean that because that's way too harsh or that's way too, that's not fair or I don't like that or that makes me feel bad. Just recently in the past month, I've dealt with two people, two, uh, two totally separate people that have fall, I'll say fallen for the deceit that there are more than one way to get to the father. Mm. That, well, what about, what about all those people that haven't heard of Jesus or, or what about those people that are really good that, that don't know Jesus or that maybe they do the teachings of Jesus, but they worship Allah, they're Muslim, but like they're super devout. And, and, and it's, I mean, just the simple truth that Jesus is the only way leads you to the simple conclusion. If somebody's not in Christ, then they're going to perish. That's people don't like that. Yeah. Thought of people perish. That's not, that's not happy. And so that's not fair. Yeah. Turn to page 394. Clues were left behind that suggested a mystery. And to many humans, a mystery is irresistible. Unless I am convinced by scripture and by plain reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Long I pondered my king's cryptic talk of victory. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I guess I have a lot of things to ponder. Welcome back to Pondering the Pages with Pierce and Kyle. Welcome back. Who are you? Kyle. And I'm... Pierce. I'm sweating. The air being out in here is... It's warm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not like I'm so uncomfortable, but it's definitely warm. It's... uh, Yeah, it's definitely warm. It's 84. At least. It's probably a little warmer now. It's probably 85. Probably. Since you and I got in here moving around, got coffee and the, all the electronics. Filming podcasts in 85 degrees. Hey, we should... Uh, We're in the Keys. We should get a palm tree over there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... I don't know if I like your uh, plant over there. I don't know if I like it either. I don't know if I like that sword either. The sword's the sword's all right. <laughs> you what? Why don't you like the sword? Oh, I don't know. I just uh, just being a hater. No, I think Jackson made that for you. No, <laughs> I think with the plant, especially with the roots being exposed, you can't really see that in the video. I don't. Uh, I'm talking like whenever I look at it in the yeah, video. Yeah, you're right. I can see it over there. Yeah. Yeah, it just looks like this big pineapple behind you, and I don't care for it. <laughs> yeah, it does look like a pineapple now that you're saying that. <laughs> Have you not noticed that before? I think that's the intention. Uh, you think it is? Yeah. Uh, with the netting the way that it is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I huh. think that was the intention. Pineapples have nefarious meanings at times, don't they? Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't thinking about that, but they do. Can. They do. Yeah. They can be portrayed as that, or they can be portrayed as delicious fruit. Yep, which I really like. Yeah, they can. What's your What's your favorite fruit? Ooh, I don't know. I definitely like pineapple. Yeah, I like blueberries pretty good. Strawberries. I like a good apple. Mm. I like a not a huge apple guy. Yeah, I like apples. They got to be crisp. Mm -hmm. I don't like a pithy or ugh, those it. soft apples. I don't think I've ever eaten an apple once in my entire life when a piece of the skin didn't just perfectly floss and stay in between the two of my teeth. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. And and I, I have experienced this. So I, I don't, I usually don't eat apples and I'll cut them up if I am going to eat them, but I don't usually eat them. Hmm. Yeah. What's your favorite? Watermelon. Definitely not. I do not like watermelon. Do you not? I thought mm -mm. you did. I don't like watermelon or cantaloupe. Cantaloupe, I can leave it, take it or leave it, but honeydew. I don't like that. I don't like cucumbers it. either. I like cucumbers certain ways. Like what way? I like them pickled. pickled. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a pickled guy. Yeah, and then <laughs> sometimes I wonder why certain like Latin food they'll have really Plantains. thinly sliced cucumbers that oh, are yeah. kind of pickled and have it with like purple onion and stuff like that. Yeah. I like that pretty well. You ever had Rolando's? They've got that's Rolando's. Yeah, what I'm thinking. About. Yeah, that's yeah, really good. 
Yeah, I like that. Uh, I wonder why, of all the pickled food, pickled cucumbers has its own name, pickle. But yeah. everything else. Pickled okra, pickled asparagus. It's pickled whatever it is instead of, we don't say pickled cucumber. Uh, I wonder, that's a good question. It has its own name. The cucumber, I guess it got in first. It got first dibs on the name. Yeah, and long time alcoholics are considered pickled. I mean, they'll say, really? He pickled itself. You're making that up. No, I've heard that I've a bunch. Never heard that before. I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's a thing. Pass me that fish bowl over there or that flower jar. <laughs> I've got those questions made. I just need to print them because we're getting low. Actually, you know what? I w- I'm going to pull one of those. How? It, I've got it on a Google Doc. I would just need to, we can do that in a little bit. What advice do you have for interpreting scripture correctly? Man, that's a great question. I think number one, read it. Mm -hmm. I would say that I don't know that a desire to read scripture is an automatic indication that you have the gift of faith, but I would say that without the gift of faith, I would say that you don't have a lot of probability that you're going to be able to interpret it on your own correctly uh, without the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Mm-hmm. Now, we're talking about alone, but you may use uh, different resources. I think Ligonier Ministry, um, the Gospel Coalition, there are a lot of different online resources that you can use as commentators to help you. They need to be just trusted teachers that you know that have throughout the course or the life of their work that they have shown to be solid doctrine teachers. Mm -hmm. And then you could use some of their works to be side by side with whatever you're reading in scripture, say that you're reading Galatians, you could pick up a book. um, Let's just say John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, John Piper, uh, you could even use some of the earlier when you could use Spurgeon, you could use a lot of different uh, trusted teachers and read Galatians and then go back and read the commentary that they have in conjunction with that. Also online resources such as Blue Letter Bible, I use a lot. They got a lot of different commentators that are on that and they come in audio and just text. David Guzik, I think, does a pretty good job. Um, and then he pulls from a lot of other people from church history, a lot of the early church fathers. He'll use some of their uh, commentary in his commentary, which I think is good. But I think that, number one, you got to read it. Mm -hmm. And I would say that without being born again or without being justified, I would say it would be difficult to have the Holy Spirit working in and through what you're reading. I mean, that's just my own interpretation. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think, I really think you need the Holy Spirit. It says, um, basically the, the cross is foolishness to the, to the non-believer, to the Gentiles. Yeah. So it's uh, scripture. And that's kind of easy to understand that, uh, there's things in scripture that if if we didn't have the holy spirit convincing us that it was true it would be difficult to accept it'd be difficult to comprehend and accept some of the things in scripture yeah. some of the facts in scripture uh on top of that as far as for interpreting scripture correctly use use scripture to interpret scripture so if you have an unclear verse if you have an unclear passage Look for a clear passage that is related or that talks about the same topic that is uh, much easier to, much more difficult to make cloudy. There's some scriptures that, man, if you got three different teachers and interpreting that one scripture, that one verse, they could take it in three totally different directions. Yeah. But there are some passages that it's obvious. It has a clear, obvious meaning that you, mm-hmm. unless you're just a, a liar and a, and a, a wolf, you're not gonna and misinterpret it. So take the, take the clear passages, um, to interpret the, the unclear. 
something that I think is a huge problem in the church today. It probably has been for a long time, but but something uh, all throughout history. But something that I think is a huge problem today is people let their emotions dictate the interpretation way too much. Yeah. Um, I know one person in particular, I've talked to you about them before, um, that their theology is completely driven by their emotion and and their... Um, their fallen view of justice, and I'm not saying they all, they alone have a fallen view. All humans have a fallen view of fairness and justice, but they let that fallen notion of justice and fairness determine their theology and what the image of God that they've created in their head. Mm-hmm. Um, R.C. Sproul was big on that. That the reason the reason people don't fear God and obey God and the reason that people have bad theology is because they have a, they have an incorrect view of God. So having, having a good view of God, a correct view of God is going to help interpret scripture correctly because you can, if you know the character of God, then it's going to make it easier to interpret his word. If the first interpretation or meaning that comes to your head is, is a, goes against the normal character of God, then you can kind of, Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but not letting your emotions get involved. If you don't like a passage or if you don't like what a passage says, you immediately begin to rationalize or come up with some meaning that this can't possibly mean that. Because, There's got to be another meaning. Yeah, this can't possibly mean that because that's way too harsh or that's way too, that's not fair or I don't like that or that makes me feel bad. Just recently, in the past month, I've uh, I've dealt with two people, two uh, two totally separate people that have, um, fall, I'll say, fallen for the deceit that there are more than one way to get to the Father. Mm. That, well, what about what about all those people that haven't heard of Jesus, or or what about those people that are really good that that don't know Jesus, or that maybe they do the teachings of Jesus but they worship. Allah, they're Muslim, but like they're super devout and, and, and it's, I mean, just the simple truth that Jesus is the only way leads you to the simple conclusion. If somebody's not in Christ, then they're going to perish. That's people don't like that. Yeah. Thought of people perish. That's not, that's not happy. And so that's not fair. Yeah. And, um, one of them is a believer, and and I was much more frustrated with them. And the other one is when the, was a non-believer, and it was a fun teaching moment. It was yeah. like, oh man, this person is giving me their attention and their ears, and I get to just like lay the gospel out to them. So it's 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 not that it's always a bad thing, uh, but anyway. So somebody interjected a thought yesterday. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm sure I've thought about it before, but I'm pretty obviously I don't have the wherewithal or whatever to determine the eternal destination of a person. That ain't my job. But we were talking about Judas betraying Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the person said, I'm not so sure. I'm not 100% certain that we won't see Judas in heaven. And immediately I kind of rejected it Mm -hmm. just because when he betrayed Jesus, mm-hmm. the devil entered into him. Yeah, that's the strongest point, I think. And the third, not that this is a disqualifier for, based on Scripture, we don't have any scriptural reference that a person takes their own life and they that is immediate access to eternal destruction mm-hmm. um, because he hung himself. But those would be three things I would say that can I can fairly confidently say if I was placing if I had two thousand dollars, I would be more ready to place my two thousand dollars betting that he's going to hell mm-hmm. than I would splitting the money up because I'm not sure. A thousand eh, he's in heaven, a thousand he's in hell. Yeah. I'd 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 gamble all my money on the two thousand in hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so what do you what was the do you remember the conversation that led up to that like what was the what was the reason for them wanting to i need to retrace the conversation because my 
my radar just kind of stuck on that. Yeah. So I'm not 100% certain. It was almost, it was getting into almost like a purgatory conversation. I've had that conversation too recently. It's crazy. It was almost a purgatory conversation, but the person is not of um, a Catholic set of belief systems. So I don't know that they necessarily believe in purgatory, mm -hmm. but they were talking about almost a second chance after after death. Yeah, it's and it's like it's, I don't think that essentially purgatory. Yeah, I mean it's it was essentially a purgatorial conversation. I don't know. It was weird, not weird, and like a oh I've never heard of this before, but trying to rationalize you know, Judas's eternal destination. He's trying to, what's, what are they, what is he called? The son of perdition. I'm trying to find, trying not to Google. I'm trying to find the, the original text or the, the prophecy that is referenced about Judas. Oh, trading him for 30 pieces of silver. Yeah. It's Zechariah eleven thirteen, but that doesn't, that's not uh oh, let's google it <laughs> who is the son of perdition let's go to gotquestions.org son of perdition is used twice in the new testament john 17 and second thessalonians 2 the son this the phrase simply means man doomed to destruction and is not reserved for any one individual in fact there are two people which the title son of perdition is applied and John, it's replied, it's applied to Judas, and in Second Thessalonians, it is it is referring to the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. The word perdition means eternal damnation or utter destruction. Would you say it was John what? John seventeen twelve is where it's uh, that's Judas. This is pondering the pages. Turn to page three hundred and ninety four. A good picture of a person who is a son of perdition appears in Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, which describes a person who, like Judas, has experienced certain closeness to God and has a good understanding of salvation, but then denies it. However, Judas and the Antichrist are extreme cases. It is never right for a human being to label another person a son of perdition because only God knows the ultimate future of each human soul. Only with these two individuals did God choose to reveal his plan for the eternal damnation. So according to gotquestions.org, call, scripture calling Judas that is, how's this phrased? By calling him that in scripture, God chose to reveal his plan for his eternal damnation. With every other person, no matter how lost or evil they may seem, we are to hope and pray for his redemption. Well, <clears throat> their, their would, arguing point was he weep bitterly and he was in anguish. Wept, what? Wept bitterly. Yeah. So was that any form of repentance there? No. I mean, I... No. People, when people murder and then get a jail sentence, they weep sometimes. Yeah. But it's, they're weeping because of the consequence, not because of, not because of, a, of a sorrow that they've committed such this... Heinous crime? It's because they're now going to face the consequences. So no, that's not... There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell, but that's not in the lake of fire. But that doesn't mean that they're repenting. They're they're regretting it, I'm sure. But sure, that led, that made me think of a question I have for you. Oh man, um, those are dangerous. Whenever <laughs> whenever you're ready for it, whenever you're you're we've exhausted this topic. So Judas hangs himself in twenty seven verse three. What? Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the piece of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. There's some verbiage there. Then when Judas, Judas his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So uh, what's one of the products of repentance, of genuine repentance? There's an, I'm just asking your opinion. Like, don't, don't overthink it. What's, what's one of the, I mean, should be turning from, you know, so that would be the act of it, but what would be one of the fruits of it or one of the benefits of it? Joy. Okay. 
and he lost every, he lost all joy. It's like he was joy, peace, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit wasn't given, wasn't was wasn't uh, living inside of us yet at that point in time. But one of the or some of the benefits of repentance are first of all forgiveness. Uh, so you're forgiven, and you have peace and joy, and there's a there's a godly sorrow over your sin that yep. should persist to a yep. certain degree. But but I will I'll say above that or stronger than maybe not stronger than that. But with along with that, there's joy and peace and and rest because I've been forgiven by my Redeemer. Somebody who has joy, peace, and rest isn't tormented so much that they end up committing suicide because of this thing that they've done that they supposedly repented for and have forgiveness for. So, so no, I would, yeah. I, th- I think it's a, uh, like fair argument, but, uh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's a fair argument. It's worth a discussion, but, but I'm good. Try like, I uh, still the gambling deal. I'm still placing my money mm-hmm. on the other. Yeah. The note from, uh, 27, three in this ESV, ESV, Reformation Study Bible said Judas's remorse is not the same as repentance. Wait, where, where are you at, Matthew? Matthew twenty seven three. Okay. It says Judas's remorse is not the same as repentance. Paul contrasts godly grief that produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret with worldly grief that produces death. Second Corinthians seven ten. Judas's regret devoid of faith in God's mercy is very different from the repentant grief that brings Peter to restoration through repentance in 2675. Mm-hmm. And we got into that word. Um, there's a difference between denying and betrayal. Judas betrayed Jesus, Peter denied Jesus. And that there's a difference between those two. You know, denying Christ. Was is, this last night that you had that conversation? It was. Okay. I was trying to figure it out. It was it. yesterday. I was trying to figure out. Was it with? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I figured it was. I'll I'll cut all that out. But Yeah. So he pointed out there's a difference between, I I pointed out, well, Peter denied him. He says, well, there's a big difference between denying somebody and betraying somebody. And I need to look at the Greek on those words. I mean, yeah, I there's get a, that. There's a, there's a difference. I, I can see that. I don't know if there's a big difference. I would, I would say. I would say one eventually produces the other i would i mean i would say uh rejection is a form of or denial is a form of of what was the other word I'm going blank betrayal betrayal and- i would say denying is a form of betraying i mean if i'm about to be i don't know if i'm about to be robbed let's say if you and i go to the gas station and i get out of the car and you stay in the car and as i'm walking up to the door some guy comes up and like <clears throat> tries to mug me and you just stay there and watch I'm like oh, i don't know him i would feel betrayed you know what yeah. I mean? like you deny you you know you didn't betray you didn't sell me to the guy but i would you know what i'm trying to say yeah so the word deny is to affirm that one has no acquaintance or connection with someone to forget oneself lose sight of oneself and one's own interests um, that is the word deny in scripture if we go to 27 and we look at the word betray, to give into the hands of another, to give over into one's power or use, to deliver to one something to keep, use, take care of, manage. And we got into the conversation, and this may be a little bit of a rabbit trail, we got into the conversation of he basically betrayed him by telling them where he was going to be when he was alone or very few people would be there. Mm-hmm because they could never do what they wanted to do when there were great crowds because the crowds believed in Jesus. They would have rioted. They would have rioted. And they knew that if another riot broke out, Pilate had already warned them. It's just like, I'm, I'm going to severely punish you. I Mm -hmm. think that it was, I'm going to severely punish you. You may be the one hanging on those crosses. If this happens again, I don't know. I'm taking out of context, but he knew where the secret place that Jesus, because he had been with Jesus at the secret place of prayer, where he would go alone with his disciples at night, maybe late at night, where well, and Satan entered into him too. So right, he had some some sort of outside influence helping. Him Definitely, to do that. probably to, I mean, just almost like it. 
blocks all con- like when Satan enters in, it's a, like almost you're basically all conviction of the Holy Spirit is is blocked in a sense. Mm, I don't know if that situation is even possible. For someone to have conviction of the Holy Spirit, that requires the presence of the Holy Spirit. That would you agree? For someone to for the presence of Satan to enter into somebody, does he just block your uh, maybe just your conscience uh, before your? Well, there's some scripture that says their consciences are seared. Yeah, right. I mean, or is that a song? I think consciences are seared. Is that a scripture? Yeah, I think that they're. I do believe that is a scripture. Yeah, yeah. First Timothy four two. So if their conscience is seared, that's that's opposite of being marked as a vessel for the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean he I, didn't have the Holy Spirit. I, th- I think it's kind of irrelevant to like if you're soaking wet and I pour a cup of water on you, that cup of water didn't make any difference. I, th- I mean, <laughs> yeah. For two, starting First Timothy four, one, but the Spirit. Explic- explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. And then it goes on to describe that reality. So the question I had for you. Okay. You and I spend a lot of time together, mm-hmm. and uh, especially between doing this podcast and then hearing you preach most Sundays. I hear a lot of um, the things that a lot of people hear once. I hear it a lot more than one time. Mm-hmm. So I, I, it's, there's a few things I laser in on. And something that you like to emphasize that I, uh, the thought had never even occurred to me and, and feels insignificant, but it's something that you like to emphasize. So instead of just critiquing you, I wanted to to... Uh, give you an opportunity to share why this is such an important detail to you. So something that you like to emphasize, particularly whenever it comes to the doctrine of election or being chosen, Okay, you like to emphasize, we have no idea who's chosen and who's not. That that thoughts to me feels insignificant because uh, it seems like mainly because the thoughts never occurred to me. Um, so something that happens a lot in, um, theology books or like all throughout church history is you'll see at different time periods, you'll see different, um, emphases. Is that mm-hmm. the right word? Plur- plural form of emphasis. Is that emphases? I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to act like it is. So you'll, so at different times in church history, you'll see different emphases of doctrines because they're refuting a very prevalent false teaching. Okay. So they'll really harp on this one thing because that's the the hmm. relevant uh, heresy of their time. So I'm wondering if if you've talked to people that whenever you talk about the doctrine of election or you talk about being chosen, that's a pushback that you've gotten a lot is, well, we, you know, how can we know? Um, and so if that's just something that's that's really uh, in the forefront of your mind or, or but th- anyway, that seems like something that's really important. Huh. That seems like a fact that's really important to you it to point out that we don't know who's chosen. So um, have you are you even aware of that? I don't know. I definitely know that I definitely know that I say that. Mm-hmm. And I think that. A lot of people because I do agree with it. But at the same time, I think that a lot of people just in conversation automatically discount a person as not being saved. Some people will discount them as not being saved based on their current their current actions. Mm -hmm. And I think that it refutes it refutes what I'm probably trying to refute is the once saved, always saved, not not refuting it. I believe that it's I believe that it's once saved, always saved. If a person truly has saving faith, even though they may backslide, mm-hmm. that does not mean that they have lost their salvation. And to, to clarify, a common misconception of once saved, always saved is once you've been baptized, you can do whatever you want and you God won't take away your salvation. That's not an accurate depiction of, I'll say, the perseverance of the saints. It, <clears throat> basically... The correct interpretation of it is once you've been saved, the Holy Spirit will produce fruit in you. It's not 
you you stay the same person and continue to enjoy and indulge in your sin and you never want to change. That's not right. That's a false. Well, saved, always saved. So, well, kind of like what we were talking about with Judas. I think conviction is there, even though you may slip and fall into sin mm-hmm. or fall into disobedience, whatever it may be. I think that the Holy Spirit will convict you. You'll quickly repent or you'll repent because of the work of the Holy Spirit that is within you. Yeah. So I think that there was a same conversation yesterday Yeah. was talking about writing for the brand and because R I D I N G or W R I R I D R I D I N G okay. or living for the brand. Gotcha. Ride, and ride or die. Yeah. It was kind of a, it was kind of a, it was a, it was a very excellent depiction. Now what he is going to do, he's going to a rodeo camp and in each of the kids camp, I think there's 93 campers. They're going to give them a, a wooden heart, just a, a four inch wooden heart and not tell them what that's for or anything. Uh, but they have to, you know, bring it and they're creating a little brand. And uh, maybe it's going to be a cross. Maybe it's a Jesus symbol. I don't know, but these are all like, cowboys and cowgirls. Mm-hmm. So they all do cowboy rodeo events. Yeehaw. So they all kind of know about the brand and people have really become educated about living for the brand based on the the hit show Yellowstone. Kevin Cl- Costner. Cl- I know what show it is. Clarify how that's how that show is involved in this. Well, it's just that is all about the brand. Yellowstone is all about the brand. If you have the Yellowstone brand on you, so they brand individuals. If you come to work for the Yellowstone, you get branded with a Y. Oh, okay. I understand. I got you. So. Just because it's not like a family-friendly show and we're talking about kids here. so I Right. I wasn't sure. Family-friendly show. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, anyway. But anyways, I asked the question, like after like a horse or a cow gets branded, if they're a longer-haired animal, will that brand be covered up? Potentially. And the answer, the answer was yes. Mm-hmm. And when they get sold at auction... They have they have shears out there and they shave that brand because you have to prove that brand. Yeah. So I think that right here, I think or where you were a while ago in Timothy, it actually mentioned that just a little bit. Okay. The brand. And I wonder if the sealing of the Holy Spirit is almost like a brand. And going back to the original question. If a person has been branded or sealed by the Holy Spirit, can they ever lose that brand? And my answer would be no. Right. It's a seal. Yeah. It's a seal. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, if it if we use the analogy of kind of like a brand, do people through falling into sin, does that does the hair grow up over the brand? covering the brand, but if you were to shave that, that brand is just as real as it ever was. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the importance of not making an island unto yourself, Mm -hmm. being around other people that will hold you accountable. When a person falls into sin, uh, they need somebody not only to correct them, but they also need people to exhort them, build them up, Mm -hmm. um, and and remind them that, hey, man, the Holy Spirit started to work in you. He's going to bring it to completion. Mm -hmm. I know that you're stumbling right now, but at the same time, it's just like, as iron sharpens iron, so as one man sharpens another. I think that we we lift each other up, and I think that we have to count the cost of following Christ. He's very clear about that. Um, but I don't know if the prodigal son is a good depiction of that. I mean, he was a son and never stopped being a son. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even though he went and lived a life pretending that his father was dead. Yeah, and even though he was he came back with the plan of saying i'm i know i'm no longer your son but just let me be a slave so yeah. even 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 though he had come to the conclusion i'm no longer a son the dad still made it clear you're still my son yeah you're never not going to be my son yeah but it's almost that his sinful living <clears throat> his riotous living whatever he was doing and there's so many different you know, theories on what he was doing, but the scripture's pretty clear, you know, spending money on prostitutes and drunkenness. Um, He came back. Yeah. I think if it's, I think if it's truly, if it's truly a saving faith that is placed upon you and you've truly become a child of God based on your profession of faith in Christ, that only comes through the gift of faith that God gives us. 
you never stop being a son or daughter ever. Yeah. Um, was, and, that, was that the consensus of the whole conversation or were there two different views? Help me understand that. Would, does say that you can lose your salvation or no? Never, never got to, okay. never got to that. It was, it was, I'm not a hundred percent certain. I didn't ask that question directly. Yeah. So based on the, cause that's essentially what the, conversation was uh the brand i mean that's essential is that the point that he's getting at is with the brand or is yeah so in not necessarily an altar call but kind of yeah yeah because he knows that some of those kids may already be believers and they're going to be given the opportunity to to brand that little wooden heart and saying will you live for the brand um whether it's a cross Mm -hmm. or jesus symbol something like that and I think it's a great, I think it's a great reminder. It could be a reminder. Um, yeah. if you've got that sitting on your shelf and you know, you've been walking in sin, whatever for a couple months and you look up there and it's like, I made oh, a yeah. commitment mm-hmm. and maybe the Holy spirit would use that little touch point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought it was good, especially for kids. Um, but living for the brand, living for the brand for Jesus or writing for the brand. I think it has an analogous, um, good word, cost of discipleship. I mean, it really is the cost of discipleship. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't think that a person, if they're truly saved, if a person truly has saving faith, I don't think that they can ever, they can't ever lose that. Yeah, I I agree. I, I think scripture is very clear about that. Once a son, always a son. Yeah. Um, I think that it's the people who have not come to a true saving faith that I think sometimes tricks, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to use that word, you're walking with these people and they start to do a lot of the same religious practices that you do. Yeah. Start to adapt to the culture. Yeah. Adapt to the culture. So you automatically assume that they've come to a saving faith. Yeah. And that's kind of a... um... So I'm, I'm, I'll use two words here. I'm skeptical and cynical. Skeptical is kind of the nicer word. Cynical is the more honest word, probably. Yeah. Whenever somebody professes faith, I'm only internally skeptical. I, I begin to watch and, and basically prove it. Wait for, wait for them to prove it. The, but I don't treat them that way. I yeah. just, I just, it's like, great, let's, let's, let's begin the discipleship process. But, yeah. but inside, um, okay, well, we'll see. Yeah. Just like Billy Graham, somebody, somebody, people like idolize Billy Graham and I've, I've kind of, uh, I've never even seen any of his stuff, but I'm kind of sick of him just cause people talk about him so much, but I don't know anything about him. He's probably a super great guy was, um, but one thing that really makes me respect him was in an interview one time, somebody was uh, asking him about his most recent uh, crusade, crusade or whatever. or whatever it was. And they said, how many people got saved? And he said, I don't know. Ask me in 10 years. It's great. Great, great answer. Retort. Yeah, that that really he uh, went up a notch in my book whenever he said that. So that being said, um, there is kind of this hyper optimism that. Any time somebody does the smallest little indication of faith, especially if you're pestering them, I guarantee, yeah. I guarantee you there's been situations where somebody is just like, okay, I'll say I believe just so you you're shut wearing up, me just out so you here. leave me alone. Well, people take that and they run with it. And then whenever that person later on denies the faith or, or falls or whatever, then that's what leads to this doctrine of oh man, he was saved, but then yeah, you can lose your salvation. We got to get him to say, I'm sorry, so that he has salvation again. Yeah. And, and I mean, how many did just snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, snap, roll the clip. Snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, snap. You have no idea the physical toll the three vasectomies have on a person. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, it's just back and forth and back and forth. And so that's kind of one of, that's a good example of how to, what advice do you have for interpreting scripture correctly? Don't interpret scripture based on your experiences. Inter- interpret your experiences based on scripture. Yeah, Just that's a good to, point. If, if, because you have this experience or you see this thing happen, 
don't take that and use that as the lens to look at scripture through. You need to use scripture as a lens to look at that situation or experience through. So, yeah. I know, think that's my rant. When I think that that's the, we can cast seed, we can water, but God makes it grow. Mm -hmm. And I think Billy Graham's statement that he made, the only way to know that God made it grow is observation over time. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing if you plant a garden. It's just like, I can go out there and put a tomato seed in the ground and I can have, I can have hope that it's going to. I can even love it and water it. But ultimately, ultimately, it's up to God yeah. whether that seed erupts from the earth and produces fruit mm -hmm. in the form of tomatoes on its vine. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we have to be observant in the disciple making process because if a person truly has the gift of faith their life will change yeah their life will change mm -hmm. it may not be huge i mean just great displays of faith that you see in scripture sometimes it may just be small incremental changes yeah. and if you exhort a person in those small incremental changes it that's like watering it. Mm -hmm. You're you're watering it. You're you're helping them. You know, keep the noxious weeds from stealing all the life giving sap. If yeah. you're kind of, hey man, you really, you you really should consider this in light of scripture. That what this part of your life you're doing is is wrong according to scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, and he'll he'll give us a he'll give us a way of escape. And I think that people talk about that all the time. God won't put on you anything more than you're able to withstand without giving you a way of escape. It says he'll give you a way of escape. And I wonder sometimes for my own life, there are many times where I know that what I'm about to do is sin or what I'm doing is sin. Mm -hmm. And instead of looking for the way of escape, I look for the way to, to accomplish the sin. Yeah. Um, I'm thankful for repentance and I'm especially thankful for grace. Mm -hmm. um, Mercy. Yeah. The reason I had hesitated on that is because I think you can, I, that is a scripture. He will not give you more than you can handle, but along with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape. However, I think you can also prove, I th basically, I think what that is saying is he will not give you a temptation that is too great for you to resist. However, what that is not saying, in my opinion, is that he will, it's not saying that God won't give you a situation in life that is, that is so hard that you can't, can't handle it on your own. I think God absolutely does give us situations that are, absolutely. that are too difficult for us to, to handle on our own so that we learn to rely on him. Um, Moses, Moses couldn't change his staff into a serpent that ate the other serpents with, on his own. God, God was required for that. Absolutely. You know, there's so anyway, that's, that's the where your reason I hesitate on that. And those ways of escape, sometimes this is what I think. And I'm grappling with this in my own life right now, as we speak or in the past, you know, weeks, is it a lack of my self-discipline? Because it does kind of give self-discipline as an attribute of a disciple in mm -hmm. in Peter's self, writings. Self-control. Oh, okay. Well, Galatians, self-control is one of the fruits. Of yeah. The so self-discipline, self-control, which I think are very, very similar. Yeah. Um, tomato, tomato. So I just wonder, is it just a lack of self-control in my life, and that's an area of my life that once revealed that I've got a lack of self-control and that that's an area that I really start to focus on. Yeah. Not because it's not because I'm trying to get some type of dead work, but because I'm trying to discipline your body, trying to be a better living example of Christ. How does Paul say it's not, is it beat your body in yeah, submission? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I, so I self-control, I, I completely agree with what you just said. But for myself, I think a something that is equally as influential, mm -hmm. or even more so in in your either um, resisting temptation or giving into temptation, is faith. I think I think yeah. lack of faith. 
I think lack of faith is uh, just as influential. Um, it talks in Hebrews. It talks about they were unable to enter his rest because of their unbelief. Uh, all of these. It it talks about all of the sins that they do kind of these three stages of sin that Israel goes through in the wilderness. And then it's finally, it says, and we know that they were unable to enter his rest because of their unbelief. Yeah. Um, and I've heard somebody preach on that too. I can't remember who that was, but basically when I, whenever you give, what is giving into temptation? It's believing a lie of Satan. It's believing sure. a lie of the enemy that this thing is going to satisfy or make me happy or whatever, mm-hmm. which is a lack of belief that, uh, I should I I should and can find true joy and satisfaction or whatever in this particular area in God. I'm I don't believe that there's a lack of faith in that truth or promise, and I'm I'm chasing after the happiness or whatever in this in this temptation in this yeah not good place. So I think unbelief is equally as um, instrumental or influential. And I think Jesus several times throughout the gospel says, Oh, ye of little faith. Yeah. And for me, there's been little trials or, and I'm going to call them trials that you walk through pursuing faith Mm -hmm. and God in his omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence comes through and it builds it builds your faith, and now you're more faithful in this situation. Yeah. But what I've fallen prey to in the past is building patterns. Yeah. And when, okay, I did it this way, um, at this time, um, said these things, and you try to reproduce that pattern, and I don't know that that's always the way that it works. I think that what happens sometimes that was God's will in that instance for that to happen that way, but it may not be God's will in this instance to happen in the exact same way with this particular person or this situation. And that shouldn't give us less faith. That should all things work together for our good, yeah. you know, in accordance with the will of God. So I think that 1 Corinthians 10 is that scripture that we're kind of looking at, uh, verse 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is so applicable yeah that is so applicable in my life um in everybody's life uh, that has faith i think that especially if there is a certain sin that besets you according to hebrews 12 run the race that's set before you and cast off every restraint i think that casting off those restraints are basically identifying the things that beset you that you keep stumbling over and then i think that having the scriptures to do battle when you see that sin kind of creeping in or getting close because you can do so good in a particular area for a period of time. It may be weeks, it may be months. And then all of a sudden it just creeps back in somehow. Yeah. And I don't know how that works. Mm -hmm. Uh, Did I leave a door open? I think, I think sometimes it's, uh, you let your guard down. I guess it's just, you get comfortable, uh, Mm -hmm complacent yeah i mean it's it's like uh, the guards that were guarding jesus tomb who fell asleep and or a better example the apostles uh whenever they when jesus was in gethsemane praying the night before and can, yeah. you, can you not stay stay awake for an hour and pray with me and they kept falling asleep i think we just we get comfortable we let our guard down and uh, we quit being well the flesh is weak the spirit is strong yeah where was that first corinthians what 10 so in 1 Corinthians 15, this is one of the most uh, encouraging scriptures for me. Same same train of thought. Paul is super long-winded, so we're still in the same train of thought here. But 1 Corinthians 15, I'll start in, in verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. I love that. Uh, 
the beginning of verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am and his, his grace toward me did not prove vain. It's like of all of the failures that I've had, of all of the weaknesses that I have and still have and, and all of the, just every time I fail God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Like I'm only as far along as I am because of his grace. Absolutely. And, and it's, uh, and his grace towards me was not in vain. So it's like, I'm only as far along. I'm only as sanctified as I am because of God's grace. So it's, I have all glory to him, not to me. I, I haven't done anything of my own. It's all any good in me is because of him. So it's giving all glory to God, taking all glory away from me. But then the next phrase is kind of this like locker room speech for me where it's like in his, his grace towards me did not prove vain. It's not in vain. It's, I'm not going to, all of the grace that he has given me, I'm, it's not, it's not going to be in vain. Yeah. Like it, you know, I'm going to, you know, he entrusted and, his, um, he entrusted his Holy spirit to you. Yeah. And so uh, if but, he did that, he's going to, and Bodie Bauckham, I'll roll the clip, but he's got a, I think it's in brokenness in his sermon, brokenness. Yeah. It's in brokenness where he, he's talking, it's, and I've talked about it on here before where the, people want to like forget all of their sins. And, but he says, no, you can't take away the memory of my sins from me because, uh, that's what, uh, that's how I see the glory of Christ. That's how I see the mercy and, and grace of Christ is yeah. because of, I know my past yet. He has still forgiven me. Um, and then he gets, he gets riled up and he goes, uh, he gets riled I'm, up. I'm not who I ought to be, but hallelujah. I'm not who I was. And he, yeah. he kind of says it in this kind of singy voice. It's uh, I'll roll it, but, uh, yeah, it's good. It reminds me of God's goodness to me. It reminds me of his grace in my life. It reminds me of where I was and where I never want to be again. It reminds me that his work in me may not be complete, but it is effectual. I'm not who I ought to be, but hallelujah, I'm not who I was. I like Bodie Bauckham. I do too, I like him a lot. I like Bodie Bauckham, I mean. He's a good apologist. I think so. Yeah. Especially with. Do you know he lives in Zambia now? He's pastoring a church in Zambia. I did hear something about that. He's mm -hmm. a uh, professor of theology yeah. or some type of. Yeah. Maybe he's not pastoring. Maybe he's... president of. Something like that. Yeah. Of theology or something. Uh, Philippians 4, which is probably one of the most well-known verses because of athletics. Yeah. Um, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. <laughs> I'm in verse 10, 410. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I think that it's... It's about Christ's strength, not your strength. Mm -hmm. And I think that it takes it takes humility to, and I think that Christ is a fantastic example of that, the best example of all. When you get in those situations of, of need or want, I think that that's where we humble ourselves before Christ. And Father, I, I need you here. Yeah. And not mm -hmm. try to do it on your own because... When you do it on your own, I think that it starts to build these patterns that we do. Self-reliance. It's yeah. self-reliance. And I think that self-reliance will be broken and you'll be you'll be punished for that. Yeah. I, I think you'll be punished for that. And it may come. Uh, you'll be yeah, if you're exalting yourself, you'll be brought low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll be brought low. And that may happen in all kinds of different forms. And it may not happen immediately like people think. So they think they got away with it. Yeah. Because it didn't happen, the, I don't know, retribution mm -hmm. didn't happen immediately. Uh, and I think it may happen, you know, 10 years down the road. But if if the punishment is, is necessary to conform you to the image of Christ, then it will happen. Yeah. It, it will happen. Yeah. You heard that joke, uh, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. <laughs> hmm. so earlier a lot earlier when you said something about cowboys you're talking about the brand 
and you said Cowboys, it made me think of this. It's something you and I have talked about before, and I think we should settle it here and now. Okay. <laughs> Is it I'm your I'm your Huckleberry or I'm your Hucklebearer? You know, so I've got it pulled up here. I, I looked at it a million times. I think in the movie he says, I'm your Huckleberry. I, okay. All right. I'm your Huckleberry. I think so too. But there was a a gif that came out probably what GIF. a year. GIF. Is it a gif? It's a gif. Yeah. A gif, not a gif. No. A what's GIF. what's a G guh. If if I give you a present, what do you call that? A gift. What's the brand of peanut butter? GIF. Okay. Okay. Um that came out that was talking about I'm your Hucklebearer. Mm -hmm. And then they went into the explanation why it is Hucklebearer. Because a Hucklebearer is the Huckles are the handles that are on the side of a coffin. Yeah. And basically he is basically foretelling, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you. So here we're gonna I do like Val Kilmer in this movie. I didn't think you had it in you. I'm your Hucklebearer. Man, I can hear both. I know, me too. I can, I can hear both. I know, me too. I'm one. your Huckleberry. I didn't think you had it in you. I'm your Huckleberry. Yeah, <laughs> I can hear both. I can hear both. Yeah, me too. I think he says Barry. I'm your Huckleberry. Because what? What's a Huckleberry? Let's let's go it's into. A, let's like go. A, into, it's like a blackberry kind of. Huckleberry. We have a Huckleberry tree at April's grandma's house. Um. Huckleberry is the name used in North America for several plants in the family Ericaceae. In two closely related genera, Vicinium and Galacea. <laughs> Nomenclature. Ooh, the name Huckleberry is a North American variation of the English dialect dialectal name variously called hurdleberry or hortleberry for the bib billberry <laughs> in north america the name was applied to numerous plants and variations all bearing small berries with colors that may be red blue or black it is the common name for and there's a lot more words in here that i can't mm -hmm. anyway the plant has a shallow shallow radiating roots topped by a bush growing from an underground stem I'm trying to figure out why he would say I'm your Huckleberry. What, yeah. what would be the meaning behind that? I couldn't find any context of it. I researched what is, that. What does taxonomy mean? Naming. Okay. Uses. Huckleberries were tr traditionally collected by Native American and First Nations people along with Pacific, along the Pacific coast. Interior British Columbia, Idaho, and Montana for use as food or traditional medicine and taste. They may be tart. With large bitter seeds, the fruit is versatile in foods or beverages, including jam, pudding, candy pie, ice cream, muffins, pancakes, salad dressings, juice, tea, soup, and syrup. Attempts to cultivate huckleberry plants from seeds have failed with plants devoid of fruits. This may be due to the inability of the plant to fully root and replicate the native soil chemistry of wild plants. Hmm. Huck Hucklebearer has a lot more... Um, yeah, just, meaning behind it or whatever. But it sounds like Huckleberry. I'm your Huckleberry. It does, yeah. But like you said, when you hear it, it's like, oh, now that that's been introduced to my thought process, I always thought it was Huckleberry until yeah. somebody said Huckleberry. So sorry that we just ruined that for somebody. Somebody out there hearing this has never heard, had just thought it was Huckleberry their whole life, and now is going to hear it as Huckleberry. I'm your Huckleberry. For the rest of their days. Let me get one of Q&A for podcasts. Let's just get a random one. What's the difference between Reformation and Revival? We've got five minutes. I'll say a Revival is is in a, a, a good Revival, not a not an orchestrated Revival, but a true Revival is just a reinvigorating of the Spirit, and it's a locker room speech, whereas a Reformation is more along the lines of a correction of a, a or multiple false beliefs. And getting back to scripture, just like we talked about earlier with correctly interpreting scripture, getting back to our lives are dictated by scripture and what it says and not anything else. Scripture is sola scriptura, everything. Yeah, I think that a reformation, I think, ties directly to the scripture, to yeah. the word of God. Yeah. I think revival is usually... The word goes out, and there's 
I don't know that revival can happen without repentance. I agree completely. Uh, I think that there should be some type of message from the Bible that goes out, which the Holy Spirit convicts the hearts of already justified saints Mm -hmm. that they revive or renew their devotion to living out the scripture to being reformed. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's a billboard in between Fort Smith and Roland that says churches have a revival. And every time I drive by it, I say, it's not up to them. Like, I just can't help it. I just got it. It's not up to the church. In my opinion, it take. I mean, you can't orchestrate a revival. You just, you can't. I don't think so. I think that it starts in the, I think it starts in God's obvious desire for that. But at the same time, I think that if a person that's in a fellowship starts to desire true repentance to happen within the fellowship, I think that they can start by, you know, themselves getting in, getting in prayer, seeking, seeking God, maybe they do whatever the, the will of God would have them do. But I think definitely go into scripture. Um, you know, some people, you know, believe in, in prayer and fasting. If they have a desire for their local fellowship to be renewed in the spirit, if that's even a word. Um, so I think that it it's can three words, four words, you know what I mean? Even if that's a correct phrase yeah so i don't a revival is that's the explicit work of the holy spirit yeah yeah i don't that cannot be fabricated by man yeah i think that a man or woman can have revival going on within their own life and they have a true desire to see that same revival happen within the other people in their fellowship based on their love for them Mm -hmm and start to seek God's face for that. Yeah. And that may predicate something happening. I think just like it says in James, you know, Elijah being a human like us, you know, prayed for it not to rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years and he prayed for it to rain. So I think that we definitely can find God's will on a particular subject or a particular thing. And then it's, but it's still the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's the whole thing. I don't think it's the work of man. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's emotion or feeling based. All right. Well, it's uh eight 30. We should probably go. I got to pee really bad. And it's like 90 degrees in here. It is 90 degrees. It was much more uncomfortable yeah. filming, but I thought we did. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I've been bouncing the whole time. Me too. I've been wiggling. My mm-hmm. shirt keeps sticking in the <laughs> yeah. back. Yeah. Well, thanks for pondering the pages with us for a while. And you couldn't feel it. But it was 90 degrees in here, and we did it anyways. It was was hot, for sure. See you next time. See you next time.